Hey everyone, Ricardo here. So one common problem that we often run into when setting distance protection elements is that they may trip for load current or non-faulted conditions, especially when set to protect long transmission lines. So in this video, I'm gonna be discussing how to make sure that your distance protection settings do not trip for load current. Now we're gonna do this by using what's called the load encroachment function in modern microprocessor based relays. So we're gonna see how we can use that function to make sure that your distance protection does not trip for load current. And we're also gonna see how we can make sure that your distance protection settings comply with the NERC PRC23 standard, which is a standard here in the United States that basically dictates how distance protection elements need to be set in order to make sure that they don't trip for load conditions. Now just real quick before we get started, make sure to download our protection and control fundamentals PDF. I'll leave a link in the description below. This is a 28 page PDF that goes over all the fundamentals for protection and control. So make sure to check it out, link in the description below. Now, as I mentioned in this video, we're gonna focus on how to make sure that your distance protection does not trip for load conditions, but we're not gonna cover the basics of distance protection. So if you wanna learn about the basics of distance protection, make sure to check out this video over here where we go over the basics of distance protection, focusing on the MO element specifically. Now, as we know, distance protection works by measuring the impedance at the relay location and seeing if that falls inside its tripping characteristic. Now this presents an issue though under normal load conditions because load current also has an impedance to it. So the relay is always going to be measuring some impedance even under load conditions and it may fall under the tripping characteristic of the mole element. So we have to make sure that we set it such that it can accommodate the maximum load that flows through the transmission line under non-faulted conditions. Now let's take a look at a spreadsheet that I developed and this spreadsheet is available, link in the description below. But basically in this spreadsheet, we see how we can use the load encroachment function to make sure that our distance protection does not trip for load conditions. So for example, and again, this spreadsheet is available for download, make sure to download it using the link in the description below. But say for example, that we have a 20 ohm transmission line. Now, as we know, a typical arrangement for distance protection, and again, we covered this in a previous video, but a typical arrangement is that we're gonna have what we call a zone one element, which is typically set somewhere between 80 to 90% of the transmission line, and it has an instantaneous trip. And then we also have a zone two element, that is set to cover the remaining part of the transmission line. So typically with a reach somewhere around 120 to 125% of the transmission line impedance, and we add a short time delay for coordination with the protection that is beyond the transmission line. So in this example, we have a 20 ohm transmission line, and you can see that over here, this line over here represents the impedance of the transmission line. So the impedance of the transmission line is 20 ohms at an angle in this case of 85 degrees and we have a zone one element, so this circle over here, which we've set to 80% of the impedance of the transmission line. So again, in this case, the transmission line has an impedance of 20 ohms, so we've set our zone one element to 16 ohms. Again, this is 80% of the transmission line. So the characteristic for the zone one element is this circle over here. Now we also have a zone two element, which again, we're gonna set somewhere between 120 to 125% of the transmission line, in this case, I set it to 120% of the transmission line, which in this case is 20 ohms. So I've set that to 24 ohms, and you can see that over here. This is the tripping characteristic of the zone two element. And in real life applications, of course, we would add a short time delay just to make sure that we coordinate with protection that is beyond the transmission line. So as you can see over here, the zone two element reaches beyond the transmission line that we're trying to protect. So we of course need to coordinate with whatever protection is beyond our transmission line. So we had a short time delay. In this example, I'm using 30 cycles or half a second for the time delay. Now, all of these values over here are in secondary ohms. And we'll talk a little bit more about primary and secondary ohms here in a second, or primary and secondary impedance, I should say. But just keep in mind that all of the numbers over here are in secondary ohms. Now, all transmission lines have a certain rating, which is typically given either in MVA or amps, but it basically tells us how much current we can push through that transmission line under normal conditions. Now this is important because we can translate this current into impedance at the nominal voltage level, and we can see what the impedance would be that the relay would read under normal non-faulted conditions. And so what we can do here is we can plot that in our MO characteristic and see whether that falls inside the tripping characteristic of the MO element. And if it does, of course, this is a problem and we need to make sure that we somehow accommodate for that load and make sure that we don't trip for that current. So again, we can use whatever rating for the transmission line and typically this is given in amps or if it's given in power MVA, we can translate that to amps and then we can see what that current equates to in impedance. And we can plot that in our spreadsheet just to see if our distance protection would trip for this current. So let's see how we can do that. 
All right, so again, over here we have the transmission line. And let me actually use a different color over here. So we have the transmission line over here, which again is at 20 ohms. And we have our zone one over here, which in our example is set to 16 ohms. We have our zone two over here, which is set to 24 ohms for this example. Now, let's say that, for example, for our transmission line, the maximum current that would flow through our transmission line under any condition is 3000 amps. And again, this would be given to you and it's a specific rating for the transmission line that you're trying to protect. For this example, we're going to use 3000 amps, but that number can be higher or it can be lower. It just depends on the transmission line rating for the specific transmission line that you're protecting. So in this case, let's say again that we have a 3000 amp rated transmission line. And in this case, this is the absolute max rating under emergencies, which is sometimes the short time winter rating, meaning the absolute maximum current that can flow through this transmission line. So as I said, we can translate current to impedance by using the voltage level that our transmission line is operating at. So let's go ahead and go over that calculation. Again, in this example, we're going to say that we have a 3000 amp rated transmission line. And for this example, I'm using a 230 kV system. So a 230 kV nominal power system. That's what the transmission line is operating at. Now, and let me actually just go ahead and draw an example over here. Let's say that we have, again, our transmission line over here. We have two breakers, one at each end. And then we have our CT over here. This is the current transformer for our distance protection relay. And let's say that this relay is an SEL421 relay, which is a very common transmission line protection relay here in the United States. And let's say that our current transformer is a 3000 to 5 current transformer and the voltage transformer, or also called potential transformer, especially here in the United States. Let's say that that's a 2000 to 1 PT or VT. So again, what this means is that what the relay is going to read as far as current is a scaled down version of the primary current. In this case, scaled down by the CT ratio. And same thing for the voltage. The voltage that the relay reads at its terminals is a scaled down version of the actual voltage at the transmission line, which in this case, again, the PT is a 2001 PT. So whatever voltage the transmission line is operating at is going to be scaled down by 2000 to 1. Now, again, knowing that the nominal voltage for this example is 230 kV and that the rated current, which I'm going to call I rated, is 3000 amps for this transmission line specifically, we can calculate the impedance when the current flown through the transmission line is 3000 amps. In other words, knowing the voltage and knowing the current, we can then calculate the impedance from that. Now we can do that very easily. The line to neutral voltage is equal to the current times the impedance, which means then that the impedance Z is going to be the line to neutral voltage divided by the current. So in our case, we have, let's say Z equals V line to neutral. And here, this is important. 230 kV is the line to line voltage, which is typically how we just define the voltage in a power system, we typically refer to it as the line to line voltage when we say what the voltage rating is. So in this case, 230 kV, again, is the line to line voltage. So 230 times 10 to the three volts, but we have to divide that by square root of three to get the line to neutral voltage. And then we can divide that by the current, which in this case is 3000 amps. And if we calculate this, we would get this is 44.26 ohms. Now again, this is the primary impedance. This is not what the relay is going to read at its terminals because the current is scaled down by the CT ratio and the voltage is scaled down by the PT ratio. So this is the impedance for 3000 amps at 230 kV line to line voltage, but we need to convert that to secondary impedance, which is actually what the relay is going to see. So to do that, we can say, and I'm going to call that Z sec for secondary, we can simply take that impedance, 44.26, multiply that times the CT ratio, which in this case is 3000 to 5, so 600. So 3000 divided by 5 gives us 600. And then divide that by the PT ratio, which as we saw over here is 2000 to 1. So divided by 2000, this gives us 13.28 ohms secondary. Now, again, what this means is that the impedance that the relay is going to see 
when the current flowing through the transmission line, in this example is 3000 amps, which in this case, this transmission line operates at 230 kV, the impedance that the relay will see is this number, 13.28 ohms secondary. So now what we can do is we can take this number and add it to our plot just to see if our distance protection is gonna trip when the current flowing through the transmission line in this example is 3000 amps. All right, so going back over here to our spreadsheet, what I've done over here is I've plotted, and let me actually zoom or scroll down a little bit. So here's a calculation, and again, this spreadsheet is available for download, so you can use this to auto-calculate for other voltage levels or other current ratings. But in this case, we have a 230 kV transmission line, and if the current flowing through it is 3000 amps, we can see that the secondary impedance and this number, of course, takes into account, again, the PT ratio and the CT ratio over here. We can see that that impedance is going to be 13.28 ohms. So what we can do here is we can plot that in our tripping characteristic over here. And you can see that that number is over here. So this is what we call our load impedance, this red dot over here. Now, in this case, that is the impedance at 1.0 per unit. And as you can see here, that falls inside the zone two element. So you can see that the zone two again is the circle over here. So this one over here, and you can see that that number or that point falls inside the most circle for the zone two element. What that means is that our zone two would actually trip for that condition, which is of course something that we don't want. Now also notice here that I've plotted the impedance at a 30 degree angle. This is typically the worst case power factor angle that they really would see under normal conditions in real life. In other words, we would expect the load impedance angle to be 30 degrees or lower. So we're using 30 degrees here as a worst case. Now I've also plotted in yellow, this other point over here, the impedance, but at a voltage of 0.85 per unit, which would of course yield a lower impedance because we're lowering the voltage. Now, this is a requirement of NERC PRC 23 standard, which again is a federal regulation here in the United States, which basically dictates how much load a load responsive element. So in other words, a protection element that would trip under load conditions like the distance protection that we have over here. How much load does that distance protection element need to withstand or needs to be able to carry? So they use a 15% margin on the voltage just to kind of account for lower voltage conditions and make sure that even under those conditions, your zone two or your zone one or any zones in your distance protection relay does not trip for that condition. Now this, again, as you can see, causes the apparent impedance to fall even deeper into the zone two element. So again, we need to find a way to accommodate this load, but still keep the reach of the zone one and the zone two elements the way they are. Now here is where we introduce what we call the load encroachment function. And what this function does is it creates a no trip region for which the MO elements will not trip. So again, you can see over here, and let me actually get rid of all of this just to make it easier to see. But we have established here that the load impedance falls inside the zone two element. So we have to come up with a way to still keep the reach of the zone two element at the number that it is, because again, that number, so this reach over here, the 24 ohms, we set that number just based on the length of the transmission line, which of course is not going to change. So we want to keep the reach at 24 ohms, but we need to figure out a way to make sure that we can accommodate these points over here, which represent load impedance. Now we can do that using this characteristic that we have over here, and I'm just going to draw four arrows over here. So this over here, this is what we call the load encroachment function that is often used in modern microprocessor based relays. In this case, I'm using the example from an SCL421 relay. Now, this is essentially another impedance-based element that blocks the operation of the model elements. In other words, if the impedance seen by the relay is outside the region defined by the load encroachment function, which I've highlighted here in white, it will block the MO elements from operating. So even though they fall inside the MO circle, so this point again falls inside the zone two circle that we have over here, even though that's the case, because that impedance is outside the load encroachment function as defined over here, that's gonna block the element from operating. Now, the load encroachment function is defined by the impedance in the forward and the reverse directions. These are settings ZLF and ZLR, for example, in the SCL421 relay. These settings define basically a circle around the origin. So you can see that this shape over here is sort of a circle and settings ZLF, ZLR define that circle for which this function will activate. 
and you would typically set this lower than the worst case impedance that they really can see, which again in our example is 13.28 ohms secondary, as we calculated before, or 11.29 ohms for the case of the NERC PRC23 requirement, which dictates that the voltage can go down up to 85%. But we would basically set these two settings some value lower than that impedance, just to make sure that we account for the absolute worst case load impedance. So again, this spreadsheet is available for download and you can play with it a little bit. So for example, these are the two settings that I'm talking about. So if I increase this to, let's say 10 ohms, you can see how this circle now became larger here on the right side on the forward direction. So let me actually move that back to 7.5. And we also have these four settings, which basically dictate the angles that these lines are at. So for example, this angle over here is 40 degrees, which is this setting over here. If I increase this to 60, you can now see how that line is steeper now. This angle now would be 60 degrees. And you can do that for all four lines over here in both the forward and the reverse direction. Now again, here I'm using the Schwarzer SEL421 relay as an example. Other relays may have somewhat of a different load encroachment characteristic. So always make sure to check out the instruction manual for the specific relay that you're using. But most modern relays have some characteristic like this, somewhat similar to this. All right, so you can see here how the Mo element can trip for load conditions and how to make sure that that's not the case using the load encroachment function. So this is a very useful function in modern microprocessor based relays. Again, that makes sure that we essentially cut off a part of the Mo element circle to make sure that we can accommodate for load current during normal operation. And again, this spreadsheet, which you can use to plot your Mo circles as well as the load encroachment function is available for download. Check out the link in the description below to download the spreadsheet. All right, so if you found this video helpful, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more videos about power system protection and power engineering. And we'll see you in the next one.